I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Stephanie McMillan. Her award-winning editorial cartoons and comic strips have appeared in hundreds of publications and venues. She's the author of seven books, including Capitalism Must Die, which combines comics with text in a basic overview of capitalism and revolution, and The Beginning of the American Fall, about the Occupy mobilizations. Stephanie's also been an organizer against capitalism all her life. Her upcoming project is a calendar called 365 Daily Affirmations for Revolutionary Proletarian Militants. So first, thank you for your great work, and second, thank you for being on the program. Oh, thanks, Derek. It's my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Um, so let's talk. Let's start by talking about your your new project, um, the 365 Daily Affirmations for Revolutionary Proletarian Militants. A, what is it? And B, how did you get the idea? Unless you'd rather answer those in the opposite order. Well, it's um, it's a daily death calendar that's going to be a perpetual one where you could use it year by year. Um, and each day you flip the page and it will give you a new affirmation. And um, they're all geared toward people trying to change the world. They're for people who want to make a revolution or to participate in that or to see it happen. Um, what was the other question again? <laughs> Sorry. The other question is where did you um, where did you get the idea for it? Oh, okay. Um, well, I started drawing uh, daily um, affirmations in 2014, and the reason that I started those was I saw a need in the among the left that um, for something that would kind of solidify um, people's ideological uh, state of mind, um, that there is a lot of division um, in the left and a lot of negativity, a lot of isolation, burnout, um, different problems, and also kind of a a low standard of work even, you know, um, a, a sort of inexperience with with actual revolutionary struggle that kind of um, made people not really aware of like the need to be very uh, determined. And, and, and so I decided to draw these as a way to kind of build that strength among people and help people who feel isolated to feel less so and um, to strengthen people, strengthen people in the, you know, their mood about being part of a struggle, which is always a really hard thing. Um, And then after drawing them all, I asked um, readers what, you know, would they like a calendar made out of these and should it be a physical calendar or a PDF? And overwhelmingly people said they wanted a physical calendar. So I did a Kickstarter for it and readers supported the idea and um, I ended up being able to raise enough funds to produce it. So it's it's um, it kind of cracks me up because I think I so let's back up a second. So you you this is not affirmations like um, like one would see on those really sort of corny calendars that are put out by 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 Hallmark. Well, it's kind of funny because in a way the form is similar, but there are all the calendars, like the daily affirmations type things, are geared toward things that help capitalism or that are just personal things, like, you know, 365 ways to gain spiritual enlightenment or um, be successful in business or lose weight or find romance or things like that that really are not. Um, contributing to social change at all and they're really popular and they're attractive and I was thinking why do revolutionaries not get to have something like that you know so I made it a little bit it's kind of funny but in a way but it's also very serious but I made them with cute animals and colorful pictures that are pleasant to look at you know to sort of lift people's spirits in the way that those other kinds of calendars do for people concerned with different things. So can you give a couple, three examples of some of the affirmations that you have? 
Um, sure. If you'll just give me a second, um, I'll pull some up. Uh, but they, they range in topic from, you know, very extremely political to more personal, uh, but still personal geared toward the political, if you know what I mean. Right. Um, one second, sorry. <clears throat> Well, while you're while you're looking, I'm just going to say that maybe after that, I want to talk about after you give a couple three, I want to talk about um, one of the reasons I think that this is actually a really important project is is because there are so many people who so many activists who who actually do need some inspiration because because we're uh, because politics are getting worse and worse and worse and the world's getting killed. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's really necessary to get some sort of boost to help keep us going. Well, exactly. Yeah, we've been on the losing side for a long time now, and we're trying to build our strength, but that requires a lot of energy and a lot of um, inner fortitude to be able to do that because it is so – the deck is really stacked against us right now. Um, I did pull some up now if you'd like me to read them. Great. Um one is a picture of a cat threatening a mouse, and the affirmation is, the enemy's threats do not deter us. And, you know, fear is something that people often express um, on the left or among, you know, people who are working for revolution. They, you know, the threat of state repression is so great that a lot of people have been, all throughout history, silenced because of fear. And threats. So I thought that was an important thing to address. And you know, I I'm sure you get this too. I can't tell you how many people have written to me over the years, and said, you know, I would love to be saying the things you are. It's just I'm scared that you know I will, you know, somebody will come in the night, or that they will, you know, never get to cross a border again. And you mm -hmm. know, whether or, or not get fired, or get fired, or just have relatives not like you and exactly you know I don't, I don't mean to be paranoid about state repression because um i think that the uh for the most part so long as they're winning the fear of it is a lot bigger than the reality of it for many of us um but mm -hmm. it is i mean if you just today i was um one of the websites I sometimes look at is called Executed Today, and it's people who were executed in, in history on that particular day. And today, actually, uh, the day that we're doing this interview, uh, which is uh, September 23rd, there were three anarchists executed in – two anarchists executed in um, in Spain as part of a big fight between the, the state and uh, basically anarchist worker movements. Um, and so, yeah. so there, there is the reality of state repression. But then, in addition, I think that, you know, sorry to go on so long. I'll just say one more thing, and then I'll quit on this. It's like, um, you know, the point, much of the point of lynchings was not to, yes, it was to kill that individual person, but it was really a spectacle of terror. That the real point is you're mm -hmm. sending a message to everybody else that if you, if you do resist, in that case, white supremacy, then this is what could happen to you. And so it's it's yeah. uh, sorry. So w do you want to say anything about that? More about the 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 importance of not letting our fear get to us. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely with you that um, there is this spectacle of terror to try to keep people pacified and quiet, and it works for um, a lot of it works for a lot of the time, and people do get killed if they start to become effective in building a movement. I mean, we saw that here with the Black Panther Party, um, you know, union organizers being killed all over the world. Um, so fear is an obstacle that we have to overcome. And I don't know if we can get rid of it completely because the threat is real, but we can move past it and beyond it, hopefully. I mean, we have to. And how do you deal with, with your own fear? How do you deal with that? Um, just basically brushing it aside. <laughs> I don't, I don't feel 
it anymore, really. I've kind of resigned. Well, when I was, I've been doing this since high school, really. Um, and at a certain point, very early on, I figured, you know, I'll probably, I thought the revolution would come a lot sooner, for one thing. And I thought I'll probably die in that struggle anyway. Um, and if I make it to 30, everything else is going to be gravy. So I'm already way past 30. So to me, it's like extra time. So I don't feel afraid at all. I feel like I've already, you know, outlived my prediction. So it's all good. Well, I think that's really great. And I think for myself that part of it is that I – um I'm not really particularly afraid right now in part because in great measure in the United States they're winning and so mm -hmm. I I don't feel like there's the immediate threat. Of course when we start to win then we're all dead. I agree. Um but the other part of it is sometimes when I start to get afraid or start to get discouraged I just think about how privileged I am to be fighting at the center of empire and how there are people especially on the front lines I'm thinking of of non-humans, and I'm thinking of uh, people in, like you said, labor organizers in other countries especially, um, and they don't really have that luxury. And so I, I, I always, whenever I start to get nervous or scared or anything else, I just think about them and think about how much worse they've got it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. A lot of people have no choice but to struggle. And um, in the United States, a lot of people do have that choice. So they have to make that choice. Um, and I do think, you know, the, we also have to think about the consequences if we don't choose to organize and build a revolutionary movement. Because if we don't do that, then, and capitalism keeps going the way it is, um, it's going to cause a whole lot more mayhem and destruction and misery and suffering than really anything else we can imagine. You know, as you know, it's threatening the very existence of life on the planet, which there can be no bigger threat. So anything else that we're doing is very minor compared to that, any other threat that we're facing. And if something happens to us personally, you know, that, that's very bad to us personally. But the important thing is to keep the movement going and to keep it building and uh, to, you know, make it win. We, we have to win. There's really no other option. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's that's really great. So what's your next one? Uh, the next one, capitalists want us to believe revolution is impossible, but they lie. And that's Wait. another thing that people face all the time is that belief that it can't really happen here. That we're told all over and over again that um, it's a pipe dream, you're being unrealistic, you're you know, pinning your hopes to something ridiculous. Um, you should be focusing on your career instead or building a little life for yourself and, you know, revolution will never come. Um, but revolutions have happened in history, many of them, and um, not always successful. But if we don't work for that, we know it's not going to be successful. And it may be a long shot, but it's impossible is a prediction that we can't let ourselves believe because um, that basically ensures that the prediction is going to come true. Right, right. That's great. So what's your next one that you want to share? Uh, let's see here. I strive to strengthen the fighting spirits of my comrades and allies. So that, that's um, also, yeah? No, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was oh let's let's um let's fight about that and and weaken our resolve through fighting. <laughs> um, what yeah, I, was, I mean that kind of fighting spirit. <laughs> what I was gonna say is is that one of the things I love about this one is that a real problem is that so many times we spend so much time attacking each other and weakening each other when we should recognize that we have you know, so much of the struggle in common and, you know, this, you and I have talked about this in public before that, that there are some disagreements that you and I have, but they're like 1%. Um, 
and you know of our of our total philosophy and i mean i've always presumed that we should take on the common enemy and then we can actually um you know w once once capitalism is gone then if you and i still have differences of opinion then then we can hash those out at that point and that's not to say we shouldn't try yeah. to hash out our disagreements but but i think that it's so important to strengthen each other's resolve you can't we can't do this alone Exactly. I mean, we have a very broad and diverse left, um, such as it is. It needs to become more large, obviously, but it's going to always be broad and diverse. People are going to always have different opinions about where we're going and how to get there. But if we can share, at, if we know what we share, at least in terms of who our common enemy is and a general direction, then we should be able to find ways to work with everybody who's going in that direction. Um, there are different levels of political organization. There's a revolutionary organization that requires a very high level of unity, and, and there's a lot of hashing out of political line in that kind of organization. But there are also very broad organizations at the intermediate and mass level where basically if you share, you know, the most broad goal, you can find a way to, to you know, strengthen each other and mutually support each other's movements if not also working together on the same project. You know, I work with people um, that I have a lot of varying levels of unity with on things, and whatever we do agree on, that's what we, we work on together. What we don't agree on, we decide we're going to leave that aside for now, and, yeah, like you said, we'll hash it out later. Um, but we do need to be able to build alliances without the – kinds of poisonous sectarianism and dogmatism that have been infecting the left for the past few decades. Like, who really cares, you know, about a fight between, you know, the Stalinists and the Trotskyists and the Maoists today? It has really no bearing on what we need to be doing right now. It's, um, there's certainly, you know, historical things to hash out, and they do have some effect on what a political, what one's political line is. But, um, you know, that's something we can discuss in a non-antagonistic way, a non, um, you know, a way that doesn't actually hurt our ability to move forward together. Um, there's a way of being unified that's principled, which involves, which includes and is open about the differences and disagreements but still finds a way to work together. And then there's an unprincipled unity, which basically buries differences and kind of coerces people to go along with you. I'm obviously not talking about that kind of unity, but a healthy one where, you know, you can move forward together with disagreement. You know, there's two, there's two examples I'm thinking of of that just locally here. One of them is that there's a local environmental organization called Friends of Del Norte. I live in Del Norte County in California. And they are... Um, they're not against civilization or particularly against capitalism, but they have done fabulous work um, stopping horrible projects here locally. And they've done fabulous work uh, raising awareness about environmental issues. And um, they know that I'm against civilization, against capitalism both. And, you know, when we still have this mutual respect going on because they respect my work and I, I think that they're doing completely fabulous work. Um, which doesn't alter the fact that ultimately, you know, we're, we're in this ultimate endpoint disagreement, which doesn't really matter because right now there are, you know, we can both work together to try to protect a specific piece of wetlands. And another local group that's mm -hmm. very, that, that has some similar things is there's a local um, transition town slash sustainability movement. And, you know, there are some things I don't, don't care for about the transition town movement. And we've, we've been very upfront about the places we agree and disagree and it's really fun to work together and to support each other's work where we can support it. Mhm. Mm yeah, and then whatever they are doing to save particular parts of the land or to prepare people for the future, um, that's going to help. Uh, you know, even if what you're working for is something more major, if that transformation happens, you'll need all that other work anyway. So it all, you know, it's all good. Um, I think there is a difference. There's 
something that Mao talked about, um, a distinction that he made between contradictions between the people and contradictions between the people and the enemy. And I think that um, among the broad masses, all the classes that are dominated by capitalism and exploited and oppressed by capitalism, um, when we have differences among us, we should be able to find a way to work together and resolve those differences in the process of struggle. But the other kind of contradiction between the people and the enemy is one that can never be resolved and is fundamentally antagonistic. And that's actually the contradiction that we have to push forward and, you know, into um, a situation of conflict so that we can defeat and eliminate capitalism altogether. One of the things, well, so, oh, so I want to make a comment on your, 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 your daily affirmations in general, but let's move forward and do one more first. Okay. Well, the next one relates to what I was just saying. It says bringing class antagonism out into the open is the first step in challenging capitalist domination. So that's really about not smoothing over that antagonism and really understanding that the capitalist system is the enemy of humanity and of the planet. And we need to really understand how it works and what it's doing to people and um, relentlessly expose and oppose it. So that's what that, that one's about. Well, I'm thinking a couple of things. One of them is, as you've been talking, I've been thinking about this thing I read in Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire when I was like 20 or something that, that, has always sort of made me laugh. And that's in the early Christian days, there were big fights between the Homo Uzians and the Homo Uzians. And one of the one of them, they were spelled the same, except one had an umlaut over one of the O's. And there were people for about a hundred years, I think, they would be they would fight each other so much that people were dying. There were hundreds and thousands of people who died in the fights between the Homo Uzians and the Homo Uzians. And their fundamental difference was that one group believed that the fires of hell were spiritual and the other believed that they were actual flames. And hmm. it's a great example of um, people killing each other over ridiculous um, small differences in doctrine. And mm -hmm. so my point partly is, is I don't think this is a problem confined to the left. This is something that I think has happened a lot in various movements forever. And the other is mm -hmm. just how ridiculous it can become when they weren't seeing from their perspective, I don't agree with them, but from their perspective, the real enemy would have been the Roman empire or would have been, you know, whatever other larger social structures there were. But meanwhile, they're spending all their energy fighting with their allies over this distinction that is completely theoretical and trivial in that case. Mm -hmm. That's a really great point. <laughs> um, so now I want to talk we can do more affirmations in a minute but I want, to, I want to talk about I want to talk about the conversation that you and I have been having right now because I think that this I mean it's really clear in this conversation that your calendar is not just a calendar and it's not the sort of thing that you just put on your wall to um, look at and go wow that's a cool affirmation but it seems to me that this whole project is really aimed at something much bigger, which is that what I think would be great would be to have people have these, to have the discussions that we're having right now where they can look at one affirmation and then they can have a three-hour discussion over this, over this point that you're making. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I would love that if that would happen. Um, People do use them. I mean, people have written to me pretty, you know, quite a lot of people um, have written to me saying that um, these affirmations have helped them uh, with uh, firming up their resolve to enter the struggle or to continue the struggle. Um, some people have even written that they print them out and put them in a jar and draw one every day or they put them on the wall or they share them with other people and um, they're meant to be used, you know, they're meant to be a, a kind of guideline 
to, um, you know, what it means to be a revolutionary militant. I think also, so I'm going to say this, and then if you don't mind, I would like for you to respond by doing the next affirmation that you want to choose. And okay. um, I think that these would be great for speed dating, too. <laughs> or, it would rule out a lot of people. <laughs> or first dates. Okay, so um, you're on a first date, and read the next affirmation. Before capital can be defeated politically, it must be defeated ideologically. See, I can see that being just the most fabulous first date ever where where the the two people are going for a walk or they're or they 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 go to a baseball game and and they're sitting at the baseball game and one person says, "Say it again." Before capital can be defeated politically, it must be defeated ideologically. And then the other person's going to throw the popcorn over her head and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> Or but then you've ruled out somebody you didn't really need to be with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or or I can see this being a discussion that lasts for the next five innings of the baseball game. Yeah, the next five years. Like, where have you been all my life, you know? Um, yeah, could okay. go either way. So you do, have a, you, ha- you do have a dating website set up associated with this, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll have to set that up. Okay, so let's talk about that particular affirmation. Say it again and then and then tell me about it. Okay, it says before capital can be defeated politically, it must be defeated ideologically. And that basically is why I made the calendar in the first place. Because in order to um, make a revolution, you first have to imagine a revolution. You have to believe that it's possible. You have to understand what it's going to take, what it's going to require from you um, before you can actually take it on. So when I'm talking about the political struggle, I'm talking about, you know, the actual conflict that's happening. When I'm talking about the ideological struggle, that's the internal conflict that happens. You know, that those decisions that you make, am I going to, um, you know, put myself first and, you know, live a very conventional life that I've been told to want, or am I going to break out of that framework and, you know, put my butt on the line and actually do something that is important and necessary for humanity and put my own needs second. So these are the choices that we have to make before we can actually even begin the political struggle. See, that's so interesting because I, I interpreted that affirmation pretty differently. Um, oh, what did you do? What did you think read, it read it again, please. Before capital can be defeated politically, it must be defeated ideologically. So everything you're saying makes perfect sense, but I heard that as kind of like what a lot of indigenous people have said to me, that the first and most important thing that you have to do is to decolonize your heart and mind. I guess that's what you're saying. Yeah, I get that. Sorry. So that yeah, we're in I agreement. Yeah, I think it's the same thing. But then there's another mm-hmm. part of it, too, that is um, not only ideologically inside of you, but it must be defeated ideologically in public as well. And I'm thinking of the, so I'm thinking like of the um, Gaelic literature revival that before the IRA could really emerge, they had to have the Gaelic literature revival where they broke their identification, not only personally, but publicly with the British and said, we are not British, we're Irish. And so once again, personally, I see it. And then publicly that has to happen too, where capitalism has to be publicly ideologically shown to be def- uh, to be defunct or to be whatever the word is, corrupt, not corrupt's the wrong word too, destructive. You know? Yeah, destructive, yeah. And so yeah, I, no, I, agree. I was seeing that Sorry. as part, part of the larger, once again, personally, it makes a lot of sense. And then also it has to happen publicly, which of course is why you would write a book called Capitalism Must Die. Exactly, yeah. Well, even if you're doing it publicly, it's, <clears throat> for people to do it internally as well. You know, um, if you're putting out an idea in public, people take that and decide what to do based on it. And yeah, the capitalism must die was an effort to make a very accessible um, and basic explanation of what capitalism is, what it's going to require to get rid of and how it works and why it's evil and all that. 
so, and basically to name it, like, this is our enemy. You know, we have to understand who our enemy is because people are being misdirected all the time by capitalists to think of each other as the enemy, whereas, you know, that's a classic um, divide and conquer kind of strategy, but we're really, you know, too often falling for that. So this is really fun, I think. So do you want to do do another affirmation? Sure, yeah. Um, here's one. Organizing for revolution may seem overwhelming, but it starts with just two people talking. And that one is a response to a question that I get a lot, which is, how do I start? Um, what do I do? I don't know how to organize. Um, and it's really simple, but it takes a long time, and it it's not it takes a lot of persistence and it begins with a conversation. There's really no other way. It begins with um what we call um in the group I'm in political reproachment, figuring out what you believe, what I believe, and where do those mesh and where do those not mesh and how are we gonna build political unity through common practice. Like what what can we agree on to do together right now and where will that take us in terms of you know, constructing a higher level of unity in the process. Well, that's really cool because if you say the word, um, the phrase building an organization, it kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies and it really scares and intimidates me. But if you say starting a conversation, that's no problem at all. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, because I think um, we've been, we've had a generation gap between the people who are around today and the last um, revolutionary movement or even even close to being a revolutionary movement in the 60s and early 70s, there was, there was a real mass movement at that time. Um, but there's been a whole generation who has not actually seen that or had any connection to that. So building organizations is something really that most people have no experience with whatsoever. And they consider we've been now overwhelmed with the organizing efforts of the capitalist class themselves, like through NGOs and nonprofits, um, where we've been taught that this is the method to organize. And it really isn't. Um, that's not the kind of organization that is autonomous and needs, you know, that actually is for the people's interests. We have to build organizations ourselves, run them ourselves, um, learn how to, how are we going to learn how to run society if we don't know how to run an organization? Um, and I have to say, too, that um, there are really no working class organizations in the United States that are autonomous. Um, you know, the, the labor movement started out being autonomous, run by workers, very militant, um, but a lot of it has been taken over by very bureaucratic unions um, who tend to stifle workers' struggles as often as they encourage them, or a lot more actually, and often, you know, lock them into very unfavorable um, conditions. And, you know, workers are now trained to kind of rely on these bureaucrats to wage struggle for them or actually bargain for them instead of waging struggle. But how is the working class going to lead a revolution and run society if, you know, we don't construct our own organization? And that requires, yeah, like you said, um, it's a lot easier to imagine that if we just consider it conversations. And it does definitely begin there. Um, it obviously doesn't end there, but um, just establishing, you know, what are you fighting for? What do you want? And does that mesh with what I'm fighting for and what I want? And what can we do together then to advance our common interests? That's where it starts right there. That's great. So so can you do another one? Sure. Yeah, I think these are all incredibly both fascinating and important. It's like it's like they're, the, each one is a little jewel. Um, no, I don't want to use that image. Um, each one is is like a beautiful little plant. I like that much better than a jewel. Um, oh, each, okay. Each and one is is just this beautiful 
plant that then can expand and grow, and I don't know how much further I can take the metaphor. <laughs> That's a nice way to put it, and I draw a lot of plants on some of these, like, you know, plants, animals. This one that I'm about to read has a picture of a little mouse standing on a branch with leaves in his or her hands uh, ready to jump off the branch, and it says, I'm not afraid to fail. If we don't make mistakes, it means we're not learning from trying new things. I think that is so important, and not just, yeah, that, I know for myself that almost the only way that I learn is by screwing up, and one hopes mm -hmm. that if I screw up 15 times in a row, then maybe the 16th time I might change, but it's going to take at least 10 times of screwing up before I, before I figure out how to do something different, and I think that's... Exactly. That's, you know, I... I was just thinking about this thing I read not very long ago about how, I don't know if this is true, but I was reading that in World War II, when a replacement would come up to the to the new unit, a lot of times people wouldn't talk to the new recruit until after a couple of weeks had passed because they didn't want to make friends with somebody who might die. The point being mm -hmm. that that there were that that you learn very quickly. I mean the the if you're going to die, the chances are pretty good you're going to die in the first couple of weeks because you have so much to learn. And that's in a situation mm -hmm. where your life is at stake as opposed to, I mean, so what? You do, uh, you and I were talking, was it yesterday? And you said you were going to go out and leaflet. And so let's pretend that this leafleting, you know, your leaflet was poorly drawn or poorly written and nobody understood what was going on. Or let's pretend you went to the wrong place. The only way you learn how to do that is by going to the wrong place. And so next time you go to the right place. That's exactly right. I mean, that's, Fear of failure is what holds so many people back, and really failure is the only way that we're going to learn. You know, does your leaflet actually resonate with people? Are people understanding it the way you meant it? You know, you have to talk to people about it if you're going to find those things out. Things are not perfect at the beginning, and we are not born knowing how to do this. Um, it takes a lot of practice. Like, you couldn't, you couldn't play the guitar without a lot of practice and a lot of mistakes and a lot of screwing up. And the same is the, the same is the case with um, trying to build a revolutionary movement. So we need to be willing to go out there, make tons of mistakes, um, learn from them. That's the important second step, and then rectify them for next time. And then we'll be making higher and higher level mistakes. That should be our goal, really, is not to be perfect, but to make higher level mistakes. Um, yeah. I don't know if you've gotten this, but I've had a fair number of people write to me over the years and say, you know, I tried being an activist for like a year or six months or whatever. I worked on this one project and then we lost and I got discouraged and quit. Yeah, and, that's really not going to help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things. One is that, that we are we are losing in general and that's why we have to fight harder and smarter mm -hmm. and better and more organized. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the other is, like you said about, um, I mean, would anybody have said, well, I picked up a basketball when I was six years old and I threw it up and I missed the basket, so I never did it again? I, yeah, I think some people would, but that's really a mistake um, because you won't be able to do anything then. You might as well just give up living if you aren't going to be willing to make mistakes and learn from them and improve. Oh, and I, I don't know about you, but, okay, I'm going to say something, and we'll pretend that the, you know, I'm 50, 54 now, and we'll, we'll pretend that the 25-year-old inside of me is not hearing this, that mm -hmm. um, the stuff I wrote when I was in my 20s was pretty crap. You know, I was not a very good writer, and the only way I learned how to write, they say you're not a real writer until you've written a million words. And the first million words, some of them were pretty bad. And we can maybe say the same thing about being an activist, that you're not a real activist until you've, you know, done, until you've made a million mistakes. Yeah, I think that works. I mean, I spent many, many years doing things that I look back on now and think, oh, God, it was kind of a waste of my energy and time. I could have been doing something better, something more effective. But there's still a lot of learning that goes on there, and you don't really know until you know. So you know, it's, you just got to get past that feeling, you know, just do those things 
there's never any activity that's wasted, I don't think. It's all, you can always learn something. So we have about seven or eight minutes left. Can you – let's try for two more and then a wrap-up. So what's, what's another, another of your affirmations? These are, just, these are so fun, I think. <laughs> Thanks. Well, here's one. My loyalty is not to the system but to those who fight it. And that's what I think gives strength. That, that's what gives strength to me and I think to a lot of other people is that sense that we're all in this together, that even if we don't know the other people who are involved, they could be across the world, they could be in the past, they could be in the future. So separated by time and space, we're working for a common cause, a common goal. And um, I always feel the presence of those people, um, you know, millions of them really, you know, uh, who – we're all in it together, and that gives me personally a lot of strength. You know, people ask me sometimes, you know, what, what gives me the strength to go on? And one of the things I say is that um, it's so great to be able to call up a friend and say um, that, you know, and, and to cry about, you know, the extirpation of some species, or to call up a friend and say, hey, the stock market went down 200 points today. Isn't that great? And one of the people I'm thinking about whenever I say that is you, because you know, many times one or the other of us has called up the other person and said, "Hey, there's this problem with capitalism. Can, you know, the stock market went way down, went down 500 points today." And like, yes, that's wonderful. And so, <laughs> you know, you have provided that uh, solidarity with me, you know, for more times than I can count over the last, you know, however many years we've known each other—10, 11. Uh huh. Like, yeah, I don't think it was that long, but yeah, maybe nine. Um, um, well, in but, however long it's been, I mean, that, that solidarity is yeah, really glad. important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is, and I've appreciated that with you as well. And I think, I think people need to uh, – that needs to be intentionally cultivated. Yeah, it really does. We have to understand that the people who are – working with us who are on our side, who are our comrades, are really the most important people to us because without them, we can't accomplish anything. We can't move forward. We can't change society at all unless we have, you know, this unified strength. So these are the people who, you know, we should care for and um, assist and, you know, really pay attention to. You know, Kathleen not B. Moore. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, just not to take them for granted. Yeah. Kathleen Dean Moore, the philosopher, has this great line about when somebody asks her, what can one person do? She says, not be one person. Oh, that's a great line. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, yeah, of course. We can't do anything without being an organized social force. That's really what we need to be building. Hey, let's fight the entire... Um, strength of capitalism and the combined military and police might and corporate might of the entire system all by myself. <laughs> yeah, that crush you like a bug. You know, I, I read once, oh, no, no, I didn't read this. I think it was, I think it was Michael Parenti was talking about how um, comic books really promote a neoliberal attitude by um, promoting a single superhero who is fighting the bad things as opposed to collective yeah. organizing. And I thought that was a pretty good point. Yeah, and novels do the same thing. That single protagonist is a real problem. And it's one that I wrestled with. Um, you know, I've done a graphic novel, and wrestling with that exact problem it's really hard because you can't draw a crowd all the time. You know, you've got to sort of pick who you're going to focus on as a character. But, you know, I tried doing at least having a group of characters, a small group, but definitely that form doesn't really lend itself to um, the collective spirit. So it is a problem. So we have about four minutes left. So let's do one more and then a wrap up. What's, what's one more little, uh, you know what this reminds me of? Um, this reminds me of eating chocolates out of a box of chocolates or something. This is like each one is just this little uh, little sweet. Oh, that's really great. A little surprise. Okay, here's another one. I resist all attempts of the bourgeoisie to pacify me. 
and that is about um, how capitalists capitalists always are looking for a way to make us give up or be pacified or to be distracted or to go into a political dead end. Um, anything but focus on the struggle and focus on the fundamental contradiction in capitalism of capital versus labor. Like we're supposed to do whatever, but not that. So we're being offered all the time constant distractions, whether it's um, political dead ends, like, you know, voting your way out of capitalism or, um, you know, doing social work that is very important, but it's not the same thing as building a revolution and could take you off that track all the way to the, you know, to drugs, alcohol, video games, you know, getting addicted to things that are both self-destructive, but also very time consuming and will just take away all your energy and time and not leave you any to, you know, contribute to the, the revolutionary effort. That's great. So, so, um, what, I mean, this has been a very delightful from my perspective, very delightful, but also kind of a strange, um, interview in that, like I said, we've been, you know, I've just been eating sweets as opposed to a lot of interviews feel like they, you know, we're just talking about jaguars or we're talking about, um, grizzly bears. And this one has mm -hmm. been sort of jumping around. So I'm wondering if in the last minute or two, you can explicitly unify this entire interview uh, for the listeners. If you can bring it all together for them. Sure. Um, I'll try. I think that capitalism is the root cause of pretty much every social problem that you can name, um, including the extinction of, you know, basically all, well, all the species that are growing at, going extinct every day to the death of the oceans, to exploitation, poverty, imperialist war, um, you know, basically all of it, racism, sexism, any kind of oppression, police brutality, um, is at the root, um, the, the glue that holds all those things together is capitalism and holds them in place. And if we're going to actually be able to get to a point where we can solve those problems, we need to get rid of capitalism. It doesn't mean that they'll automatically be solved at that moment, but at least that path will be open. They won't be held in place by a system anymore that encourages and needs those things and causes those things. So instead of focusing on the effects of capitalism and trying to ameliorate, ameliorate them, we need to be focusing on the cause and going after that cause. So, and also I just want to mention if, if anybody out there is listening to this and wants to get involved and organize, um, they're free to get in touch with me. And my website is stephaniemcmillan.org and my email address is on there. And, you know, we are, I'm trying to build an organization several actually, and not just draw cartoons, not just write, not just make calendars, but do them for a purpose. And that purpose is to build organizations. Well, that's really fabulous. And thank you so much for being on the program. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Stephanie McMillan. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.